Battleship Texas was at the hinge of a major transition in U.S. battleship design. On one side of the hinge, she and her sister ship New York were the first battleships in the world to mount 14-inch guns. On the other side of the hinge, Texas was the last U.S. battleship to burn coal and the next to last to be equipped with reciprocating engines. She was also the last to use an incremental armor design that determined its size and location based upon a wide variety of threats. Armor on following ships incorporated an all-or-nothing concept that only protected vital components. Before we get into that, let's start by touring what's on Texas. We'll then take a more detailed look on how armor was used as protection and the changes that occurred with the move to the all-or-nothing concept. It's physically impossible to armor the entire hull of a ship without adding so much weight that it becomes a fish habitat. Because of this, armor must be limited to protecting vital machinery, weapons, and the ship's ability to remain stable and afloat. Doing this requires two basic types of protection. Vertical armor that protects against low angle shell hits and horizontal or deck armor that protects against plunging shells and aerial bombs. Let's start by looking at Texas's vertical armor. All battleships and cruisers incorporate belt armor whose primary function is to protect the ship's waterline against penetration that can quickly flood a ship and destabilize or even sink it. It has to be capable with standing hits from the largest shells and except for that on turret faces is the thickest armor on the ship. We're now looking down into through a manhole on the third deck and what we're seeing is the space between the outer hull and the inner hull. This is the outer hall here, and uh, you can see that there are some rather large bolts that are uh, extend through it with nuts on them. What these bolts are is they are the retainers for the main belt. We can't see the main belt itself because it's not only covered by the torpedo blisters on the outside, but currently those uh, torpedo blisters have been filled with foam that completely blocks any vision of it at all. But uh, this is certainly uh, evidence here that yes, indeed, there is belt armor there, and these bolts and nuts are what hold it in place. Above Texas's belt is the lower casemate armor. It's slightly thinner than the belt and starts just above the waterline to give additional protection against flooding and shell penetration into interior engineering spaces. So here on the third deck level, we can see additional bolts and nuts. They're a little bit smaller than those that uh, retain the belt armor, but they extend all the way from deck level up to the overhead, and it extends even farther up by a foot or two on the second deck. These hold what's called the lower casemate armor in place. Now this armor was a little thinner than the main belt, and we'll talk about that a little bit in some uh, drawings and graphs. The last bit of side armor is on the upper casemate. It's relatively thin at six and a half inches and offers little direct protection against anything larger than five and six inch shells. The upper casemate armor combines with diagonal armor and the number two and three turret barbettes at its forward and aft ends to enclose the central portion of the second deck in what is called the armored citadel. The citadel protects two critical functions on Texas, the freshwater evaporators and the boiler uptakes. We're about to enter one of the former five inch gun casemates that's on second deck. But before we do, we're out here in the starboard passage and I wanna do one thing real quick, which is to knock on this inner bulkhead. You can hear it's rather thin and it's uh, just standard uh, steel, mild steel plating used for uh, non-watertight bulkheads. Now having done that, let's go inside and take a look at what we have. This is a former opening for a five inch gun emplacement. Now a lot of modifications happened in this particular space during the 1925 and 26 uh, modernization. The hull actually stopped right here where it set in and the gun muzzle stuck out. But all of this structure was added to it during the modernization, including these large vertical I-beam columns and the reason for that is that uh, on the main deck immediately above us is where they installed what we call air castles. And on those air castles are, five, are three of the five inch gun mounts. So that was a, a lot of weight that had to be supported and that's what this structure did. Now having said that, we can look at the original upper casemate armor. We can see that it's, while it's tapered, it's basically six inches thick here and then it actually stops right there at that joint. 
And below that is where the, um, the top of the lower casemate armor, right there at that riveted joint. So let me turn that light down a little. There we go, much better. So everything below that seam is uh, a lower casemate armor. Everything above it is upper casemate armor. And it basically stopped right at this vertical plate. So it was a fairly narrow thing. And it offered some protection, but not a lot, because you had these big openings here where a shell could come through. Of course, uh, what would likely happen is the shell would strike the gun mount and uh, then explode. But here's the thing about it. Whether a shell exploded or not, um, when it strikes that armor, you might have what it's called spalling, which is what we'll talk about in a couple of drawings. But that spalling is those high-speed shards of steel that bounce around in here will likely kill everyone in this space, and it's important that it be stopped. So these bulkheads here on the sides are STS armor. Now that's only about an inch thick, and that's protected the separate gun emplacements uh, if, if an explosion happened in one of them. But here on the uh, inner bulkhead, this is inch and a half thick STS. And this is what stopped all of those steel splinters that might be flying around at several hundred feet a second. That's why we have this bulkhead here. It's hollow. Not hollow, but thin. So. Uh, all of the protection happened inside this room. No question you'd lose a, a, a gun crew that took a heavy a shell hit, but hopefully all the damage stopped here. Now, would this stop a 10 or even an 8-inch shell from a cruiser? No, it wouldn't. But what it would do is it, stop, it would stop lower caliber stuff like 5 and 6-inch, which was part of the theory behind incremental armor. Now we're going to move forward and show you another aspect of, the, uh, of what we call the Armored Citadel. A short walk forward from the gun casemates brings us to a diagonal bulkhead made of Class A armor whose thickness tapers from 6 inches at the top to 9 inches at the bottom. This is one of two that connect with the turret 2 barbette to form the forward end of the Armored Citadel and two more that attach to the turret 3 barbette to form the aft end. I'm now standing in a passage on the starboard side in officer's country, which is immediately ahead of the armored citadel. And I want to show you this because we have this diagonal armor that's quite thick. It's In fact, it's about nine inches thick. And in order to provide maximum protection, we also have an exceptionally heavy armored door here that can be closed. But due to its weight, it had to be closed using a geared mechanism. You can see the wheel on this side. There would have been one on this side that has been removed and then uh, ran this gear drive that could open and close the door. So now once we step in, what we have is a citadel. Outboard here are the uh, uh, gun casemates that on the outside part of the hull is where that upper and lower casemate armor is that protects it. On this bulkhead is the STS armor that acts as a splinter shield. And then we get into the, uh, to the lighter weight stuff here. That covers most of the vertical armor, but what about horizontal armor that protects against high angle shell hits and aerial bombs? The thickness and weight of Class A armor is simply too great to use on large deck areas and for complex shapes, so this is where STS armor comes into play. STS, or Special Treatment Steel, is an extremely tough steel alloy that provides good armor protection against small and medium caliber shells without being tempered. It was most widely used as deck armor on the second and third deck levels and as roofs on turrets and the armored conning tower. STS also completely enclosed aft steering, central station, and the combat information center. However, as deck armor, it was not particularly effective in protecting against plunging fire and bombs, as can be seen by its failure on Battleship Arizona. To be fair to the designers, that was not its original purpose since bombs and long-range plunging fire had yet to be threats. What it did do was protect interior portions of the ship by keeping the blast effects and splinters from exploding shells away from vital equipment and ammunition magazines. Let's take a look at one portion of it where we can see it in cross-section. Now one thing we haven't talked about is what was done to armor the deck here on second deck. Um, 
Now, the, the uh, thicknesses varied on different parts of the ship, and so it's a little hard to talk about. Plus, some of the documentation is pretty poor, but here it's pretty obvious what happened. Here's a major uh, deck hatch that goes down to third deck, and we can see that uh, if we took, take a closer look, there's actually three layers to it. That first thin lower layer is simply mild plate steel that is used as the base. Above that is uh, one and a half inches of STS armor. That in this case is the original uh, deck armor for the second deck. And then above that that's uh, set back a little bit larger is an additional layer of inch and a half thick STS armor. So altogether we had a total of three inches of, of armor Whoa, boy, that sure went dark all of a sudden. We had, suddenly had three inches of, of deck armor. Now, was that enough? Not really, because uh, Arizona had uh, better armor than this, and we all know what happened to it. But it was a somewhat moderate improvement over what the ship had before. When you think about it, the task that armor has to accomplish seems impossible. The idea of stopping a 1,500-pound shell traveling at more than 1,000 miles per hour puts the task in the category of an irresistible force meeting an immovable object. However, when properly made and used, Class A armor could do exactly that. By the way, this subject is both very technical and extremely complex, so the following is meant only to provide a broad-brush description of the problems and their solutions. It will also be limited to armor technology available during the first half of the 20th century. Even the toughest steel alloys can be defeated by armor-piercing shells unless they are tempered to make them harder. However, tempering armor its entire thickness will make it brittle enough to shatter when it's hit by a shell. Even if it does stop a shell, fully hardened plate can suffer from spalling. This is where pieces break off of its back to form splinters ejected at high speeds that will destroy equipment and kill crew located in their paths. To inhibit this, only the outer layer of Class A armor is tempered or hardened. The remaining thickness is relatively soft to provide support that more readily absorbs shock and reduces breaking and spalling. While it can be very effective, Class A armor suffers one limitation. In order to provide a plate that has both the necessary hardened face and depth of softer steel behind it, overall thickness generally cannot be less than 6 inches. Below that, STS armor becomes the preferred material. A high capacity or standard shell will most likely break up when it strikes Class A armor, meaning that a special shell must be used to punch through it. An armor piercing shell is constructed using much the same theory as the armor it is designed to defeat. It takes a hardened steel shell to defeat face hardened armor. However, like the armor, a fully hardened shell will likely break up when it strikes its target. So using the same technique as that on Class A armor, a hardened steel cap is attached to the nose of a softer steel body. The result is the softer steel will support the cap and absorb much of the impact shock so that both the cap and body survive long enough to break through armor and interior bulkheads. To complete the job, a base mounted time delay fuse triggers at initial impact, then waits 35 thousandths of a second before igniting the shell's bursting charge. This gives the shell time to punch its way deep into the ship before exploding in vital areas. On the other side of the coin, what can be done to help armor defeat an armor-piercing shell? Increasing its thickness by even an inch or two can greatly increase armor's ability to stop a shell. Stopping ability can be further improved by changing the armor's angle or slope to both increase the thickness of the armor presented to the shell and change the shell's striking angle. Even then, it may not always accomplish the primary task of stopping a shell outside of the ship. However, even if penetrated, armor will frequently break the shell's cap or detach it from the shell's body in an action called decapping. Once that happens, the shell's ability to penetrate is dramatically reduced. However, the shell will still likely explode and this is where interior armor comes into play. STS armor located behind the outer armor in bulkheads and index will help contain the effects of an explosion in splinters to reduce damage to critical areas. Unfortunately, it was poorly placed in Texas when compared to later ships, as can be seen in cross-sections of both Texas and Nevada. The addition of a splinter deck in Nevada demonstrates one of the great improvements that resulted from rethinking armor protection. The differences in design can be appreciated by comparing battleships Texas and Nevada. More than 600 tons of weight was saved simply by reducing the number of turrets from 5 to 4. This was made possible without reducing the total number of guns by modifying two of Nevada's 14-inch turrets to mount three guns instead of two. 
Eliminating a turret also saved weight by shortening the length of the belt armor since four turrets and their ammunition magazines take up less waterline length than five. Additional weight was saved by eliminating the upper casemate armor and much of the lower casemate armor. The large sections of angle armored that formed the ends of the armored citadel on Texas second deck were also removed for even more savings. This freed up enough weight to allow an increase in maximum thickness of Nevada's main belt from 12 to 13 and a half inches and significantly increase its height to extend protection farther above and below the waterline. An angled splinter deck was also added behind the belt to protect against spalling and fragments from shells and broken armor that would otherwise penetrate more deeply into the ship. Changes like these on Texas would leave her freshwater condensers and boiler uptakes unprotected. This problem was solved on Nevada and later ships by enclosing the uptakes in angled 14-inch thick Class A armor and by moving the freshwater evaporators down to the bottom of the hull and away from direct threats. It goes without saying that armor was critical to a ship's survival during combat, but it was only one of three major elements that combined to keep a ship afloat and in the fight. Damage control, which was the crew's response to damage of all types, was essential. Without effective measures, even minor damage could grow to disable or even sink a ship. Unfortunately, the subject is complex and constantly evolves, which puts it beyond the scope of this channel. However, we can and will address the third element in future videos, which is compartmenting or dividing the ship into scores of smaller compartments to isolate and control flooding that was always expected during combat.